Taking standard landscape shots with a drone is all well and good, but what if you want to showcase the whole damn view and not just a little part of it? Well, that's simple. You widen the view, you expand the horizon, and you go panoramic. And that's what this video is all about, the second in my raw drone photo processing guides. I'm going to walk you through the whole process, expanding your drone photo repertoire and scoring some epic panos along the way. The secret to creating a high quality pano is to do the prep work. You can save yourself a lot of time and effort by photographing the individual frames of the pano correctly in the first place. If you've ever tried these, you'll know that the stitched panos that the DJI app produces are usually awful quality and it does a terrible job about fixing the sky. So it's important to do it manually using the source files yourself. And so before we discuss how to process the panos, Here's my guide to taking the photos in the first place. Hey guys, and welcome along to beautiful Seven Mile Beach. And I've come down here to just quickly run through taking a pano with your drone in case you've never done it. It's pretty simple, mainly automated, but there's a couple of gotchas that I will mention as we run through the process. So Let's get the drone fired up and up in the air and I'll walk you through the process. I fired up the drone, I've got it in settings, I've gone for aperture priority mode, I'm in F8 because I want everything in focus. You don't really want a wide open aperture, particularly on quite a sunny day like today. So let's send the drone up and take our pano. Your home point has been updated, please check it on the map. Oh, absolutely stunning. I'm going to take a little bit of video to show you guys how beautiful this is down here. Look at this. Beautiful. Absolutely stunning down here on Seven Mile Beach. I've got to tell you, flies are bugging me though. <laughs> Piss off. Welcome to Australia. <laughs> Wow, look at that. So, let's stop filming some video and get back into photo mode. So we're 15 meters, I'm gonna take it up a bit more. Now, the first thing to say about panos is, quite often, you don't wanna be, you know, 120 meters up in the air. Quite often, the panos look better when you shoot them down, because you're getting, you're more in the frame. So, not 25, I'm just gonna send it up to about 30, I think. All right, so let's go into settings, photo, and we want to shoot a pano, and it's a 180 to start with. Now, where you position the drone is where it's going to be the center of the frame. So I don't want it dominated too much by the ocean there, so I'm going to nudge it slightly to the right. So I'm positioned in the center of the frame there. I'm going to start it going, I press the start button, and it will shoot that full 180 degree all right so the drone's doing all the hard work it's shooting that full 180 degree uh, field of view for me it's directly above my head That's done one side. When you first get a drone, these automated modes are slightly worrying. They were for me anyway, because you're kind of handing control back to the drone for the time being. We have finished our 180 degree. Now, while the drone's up in the air, I'm just going to flick to photo, to film mode, and just talk about something when you're shooting at the beach all pano software without exception has a problem stitching panos of the ocean when it's blue sky so if you can 
visit on a day with some clouds, something for the pano software to key into at the edges of the frames of the images. So I've got some nice clouds on the horizon. It's gonna have a harder time with the sky up there, but fingers crossed we'll be able to do it. But as you can see, we've got some cloud uh, all the way along the horizon there. And there is a little bit of cloud up further up as well. Not much, some tints, it may be able to key into it, but it really does struggle the pano software. I don't know who, don't care who makes it, whether it's Lightroom you're using or uh, PT GUI even, which is the best at the moment. They all still struggle when there's some featureless blue sky. There's nothing for them to key into. So I'm going to turn that off and we're now going to switch to the sphere mode. So I'm going to go back to the camera, go into settings, photo and sphere under pano. Get out of that. And I'm going to go a little bit higher up this time because we want to get as much as we can into that 360 frame. So I'm going to go up to, let's say, uh, 90 meters will do it. And again, wherever you position the drone, that's the center of your frame. So I think that's actually a pretty nice starting point that way and we'll set it going. Now, of course, the problem with the 360 on a drone like mine, the Mavic 2 Pro, is it can't shoot all the way up. So whatever else happens, there's going to be a patch of this sphere, this 360 sphere, that isn't captured by the drone in the photographs. And we have to substitute that for our own sky in the post-processing. One of the other problems you'll run into with a 360 sphere is balancing the light. If you use auto exposure and set it off shooting into the sun, then you'll find that the stuff behind you will be in heavy shadow and vice versa. If you start off exposing for the uh, scene behind, then you'll find that you get blown out highlights. It's pretty tricky. Not gonna be a problem today, particularly not with the aperture I've chosen. All right, the 360 has finished. All right, I'm back from the beach and I've imported my photographs into Lightroom. And in order to make my life easier, I do like making my life easier, I always transfer the photos off the SD card and onto my photo drive using a different folder for each pano. I have a bit of software called Hazel that does all that stuff with the folders for me. So it's not an issue when I come back, even with hundreds and hundreds of shots on my SD card. If you're interested, I did a video about Hazel, which I will link to up there. Keeping each pano in its own folder makes life much easier later on when you're trying to work out which photo belongs to which pano. As you can see from my file directory, I actually utilize a little hierarchy of folders which keeps everything neat and tidy and easy to work with. Now the first dilemma you'll face when working on your panos is whether or not you should process the photos before you turn them into a pano. And the answer to that question is that you should do both. You should definitely do some processing before rendering your pano and then you should do some final edits on the merged image. Some of the edits that you should put in place before rendering your pano are things like color profiles, lens correction, dust and dirt spots, and some basic tweaks to white balance, exposure, and white and black points. It's important to do these first because they cannot be fixed in the merged image. For instance, if your drone's photos have some slight vignetting, as some do, then you'll need to sort that before merging because it can't be done afterwards. It's also important to use consistent edits across all of the shots in each individual pano. If you don't, that pano will just end up looking weird. In order to speed this process up, I always get one photo in the sequence correct and then simply copy its settings over onto the other photos. You do have to tweak each one very slightly after copying and pasting the settings, but it's a lot quicker than starting from scratch and means that you get more consistency. Once you've completed your basic edits to the photos, you can now render them. Most panorama software can handle 180 panos without many issues, 
but not all of them can do 360s. In terms of the software you use, I have a couple of recommendations. I do 90% of my flat plane panos in Lightroom, and that's what I'll be using for this first pano. Windows users can use the Adobe Suite, of course, as well, but there's also Microsoft's own pano application, the Image Composite Editor, otherwise known as ICE, and this comes highly recommended for both 180s and 360s. The software has been discontinued by Microsoft, but you can still find it online. Hugin is a free and open source panorama editor, which is excellent and can render all types of panos from straight flat plane all the way up to tone mapped 360s. Serif's Affinity Photo has an excellent panorama rendering engine with some advanced tools that enable you to fix up common stitching errors. While Lightroom and Photoshop are fine for most panos, I also use PT GUI, mainly for my 360s and for some problematic 180s. It's an expensive bit of software though, and probably not something you'd want to invest in unless you're gonna get seriously into panoramic shots. All right, so let's process this 180 pano. The first thing I'm gonna do are some basic edits to the first photo in the sequence, which then I'll copy across to the other images. And in this case, there's not much that I need to do because I shot it in broad daylight on a sunny day with an F8 aperture. So in Lightroom to create a pano, you select all of the images in the sequence and then select photo merge and then panorama. Depending on how fast your PC or Mac is, the preview will take a few seconds or as long as a minute to appear. Once the preview has appeared, you can decide what to do about the alpha region around the pano. And Lightroom has some great options for this. Firstly, you can select the boundary warp option, which stretches the edges of the image out to the boundaries of the frame. Secondly, you can choose fill edges, which uses Adobe's content aware fill to fill in the blank areas using AI. Thirdly, you can simply crop the image using the Auto Crop tool. Personally speaking, I've always liked the Boundary Warp tool because you get the full size image and it's only using actual pixels from the source image, not fake ones the AI has dreamt up. Lightroom will now render the pano. On my 2019 iMac, this takes about a minute, but the time will vary depending upon the kind of machines you're using. Now we can do all the final edits on the pano and transform it into its final state. I use the new AI masking tools in Lightroom to do some basic edits on the sky and some minor tweaks to the white and black points and shadow and highlights in the rest of the image. After rendering your pano, you may well find some stitching errors. This is really common for panos taken at the coast and in particular when you shoot out over the horizon looking out to sea. Cleanest way of fixing these is to tweak the original control points, but this is only possible in full-blown pano apps such as PT GUI and Hugin. There's no simple way of correcting them in post either, but I found that Photoshop's clone stamp tool is the best option as it enables you to hide those obvious lines such that when you view it at full size, they are not at all obvious. You can now output your render at full size. Okay, so for 360 panos, most of the steps are the same as for the 180s. Import the photos and then do all your base corrections so that the photos are ready for stitching. Not all pano software can do 360 panos. Lightroom and Photoshop, for instance, do not. I bought PT GUI specifically to do 360 spheres and have found it to be excellent for this. To create a 360, simply import the images into PT GUI and click the Align Images button. The software will examine those images and make a decision about the type of pano you're creating. In our case, it realized this was a 360 equirectangular image and it stitched everything accordingly. It did a great job on that stitching, requiring no extra input from me. And now all I need to do is export the image. So now we have the big problem with most 360 panos on most drones. Unless you've got a Mini 3 Pro, the gimbal cannot point all the way up, which means there's a large bloody hole at the top of the sphere where the sky should be. We can add that sky back in using Photoshop, but you will need a replacement sky image to put in its place. Over the years, I've built up a collection of skies for just this purpose. But if you're starting from scratch, you can find them on any of these stock photo libraries. Search for Equirectangular Sky or Zenith. Also, make sure they are wraparound or you'll end up with a bloody great line in the middle of your 360. 
Try and match your replacement sky's clouds to the ones in your pano, but do bear in mind it doesn't have to be precise. Now that we have a new sky, we can add it to the 360. In Photoshop, place a horizontal guide at the start of the transparent alpha region of the image, then place a vertical guide where the sun is. Now drag your replacement sky photo into place and ensure that it completely fills the top half of the pano from edge to edge. I use the snap option to make sure it's exactly at the edges of the frame. Place the image and then add a mask to this layer. Select the gradient tool and drag upwards from the middle of the pano to just below your horizontal guide. It takes a bit of trial and error to arrive at the right distance to drag that gradient for, so don't be afraid to hit Ctrl Z and try a few options out. In my case, a very short gradient seemed to work best because the hills in the distance do not rise very high into the sky. The new sky is in place, but the sun is probably not in the right position, and so we need to move it properly to sell this replacement sky. If it don't look right, everyone will notice. To do this, select the new sky layer and select Filter, Other, Offset. Using only the horizontal setting, use the slider to experiment with the correct number of pixels so that the sun is sitting directly over that vertical guideline. In my case, I had to shift it about 4,000 pixels to the right. Now it's simply a question of flattening the image and saving it. So that's how you can use the 180 and 360 sphere modes on your drone to produce epic high quality images. And incidentally, if you export those 360s at 6,000 by 3,000 dimensions on the long and short edges, you can upload them to Facebook and turn them into interactive spheres that people can click in and rotate to their heart's content. I've always found them to be incredibly popular when I upload them to my socials. All right, that's it for this video, guys. I hope you enjoyed it and it has inspired you to go and create some bloody great panos yourself. Panos are large files and they lend themselves really well at being printed. Here's an example I've done for my own house to take my mind off my dodgy knees when I was on the treadmill. Shot this pano over Currumbeen Creek and Huskisson in nearby Jervis Bay. If you enjoyed this video and got value from it, then please give me a like just down here. For more videos like this in your feed, hit the subscribe button just over there and stay tuned for the final part of this series, processing multi-image or bracketed drone shots. Till the next time guys, ta-ta.